Hello, everybody. Good evening. My name is Amy McCoskey, and I work for Contra Costa County Library, and I'm the Youth Services Librarian Specialist. So I don't usually get to hang out with adults in the evening, so I'm very excited to be here with all of you. We're so glad that you're here for our watercoloring, watercoloring for beginners with Lisa Fulmer. We're very lucky this summer that she's joining us for three different arts programs. We already had our nature journaling. If you missed that, don't worry because it's available on our YouTube and Facebook pages for you to watch anytime you'd like. And then later we'll have another program and I'll tell you about that. So you will only be able to ask your questions in the chat or in the Q&A, but Lisa is perfectly happy to answer your questions along the way. And then of course, at the end. Yes, you, somebody is already asking, you are, you are muted and your cameras are not on, so nobody can see you and nobody can hear you. So you can just sit back and enjoy the program for tonight. You don't need to worry about that. So I'm now gonna pass the baton to Lisa Homer. Hey, everybody. I'll wait to, there I am, hello. <laughs> How's everybody doing tonight? I hope you're doing well. I hope you're staying cool. Um, this is my home studio. Uh, that is uh, my share doll. <laughs> Very important to point out share. Um, and uh, this is a painting I'm working on. It happens to be with acrylic. So it's in the very beginning stages, but it um, creates a little backdrop. Uh, my name, as she said, is Lisa Fulmer. I am um, a marketing consultant by day, but I work in the art materials industry. So my clients uh, my large clients are manufacturers of products. And while we talk a little bit about what products today, I will let you know, I will give you the disclaimer, like, hey, I work for these people or, hey, I don't, but I'm not pitching or, you know, no, no commercials here. Um, and I also work with uh, local artists and local, um, uh, our local art gallery here in Concord. I'm in Concord. Um, so I'm a community arts advocate as well. I, I'm uh, very active with the Concord Art Association, past president and current board member. And I try to teach as often as I can because uh, I enjoy it and it helps keep my own skills kind of honed up. I'm a mixed media artist. I work primarily in the abstract. I don't do much representational or figurative uh, or uh, realistic. And what's interesting about watercolor in particular as a medium is that most of what you probably see is more representational or even hyper realistic and you know people tend to draw an elaborate sketch and fill it in with the watercolor right um and i'm going to show you tips and techniques that are uh less complex than that and we only have an hour so i'm going to get pack in as much information as possible so um and i will try to stop and ask questions along the way but uh, amy knows that she's welcome to interrupt me if you have something pressing in the chat so I'm going to start by talking of just a couple of minutes about supplies. Some of you may be playing along. Some of you may just be watching for um, inspiration for later, especially if you're on the replay. Um, so supplies, watercolor can be very affordable or it can be very expensive. Um, and I will say that as can be the case with many art supplies, um, oftentimes price and quality go hand in hand, not always, but if it's really, really low priced, it might also be really low quality and that's okay. It's totally fine to start out with a small set of watercolors that you pick up even at Staples or at the office supply store. Um, and then, but if it's something that you enjoy, I highly recommend that you step it up just a little bit and try to find just a slightly higher quality and kind of just work your way up and you'll, you'll really see the difference. I learned that um, the hard way with colored pencils, um, the lower quality colored pencils, I could not get the same effects that I could get with the higher quality colored pencils. And it was, I was disappointed. So you wanna just keep an open mind and make sure that you're using the right tool for the right job and, um, and that you're working with as high a quality as you can afford and, and it, it's all good. So in terms of the different kinds of watercolor paints, most of you are, are um, oh, let's go ahead and switch back to the, um, switch down to the workspace now. We're gonna change the cameras on you. There we go. So um, 
uh, as far as the kinds of paint, you're probably familiar with seeing watercolor in a set like this. And each of these little um, boxes is called a pan, like a frying pan. And um, you might hear the term half pan, meaning the size. There's like a full pan and a half pan. This, I believe, is a half pan. And you've probably seen the sets that are also in longer boxes with like little ovals of, of paint and a little a little bit of a palette well beside it. Um, this is a longer um, a longer style box. And what's nice about these metal boxes, whether you know whether it's a little mini set or a bigger set, is that it create it gives you everything in one place. You have all of these palette wells and I'll talk about palettes in just a minute and all of your paints and oftentimes you even have um, empty spaces to mix your own colors and we'll talk a little bit about mixing as well. Um, what I like about these little minis is for traveling. If, uh, if you catch my nature journaling session, I'll talk a little bit about that because this this one has like a little thumb ring. It's really easy to hold. It's small, but it, it fans out and gives you plenty of space to work. Um, so paints come in this sort of hard little cakes that you activate with water that those are called pans. You can also get watercolor. Um, the higher quality watercolors come in a tube like this, and it's it's really highly pigmented and it's a nice um, a nice viscosity and you just put a little a little pea sized drop in your palette or on your palette paper and we'll talk about that in a minute. The other ways that water based media or watercolors come are in sticks. And this is pure pigment. It's just like what's in the pan, except it's in a stick form. So it's dry and you activate it with water. What's nice about the sticks is that you can actually draw with it, smudge with it. You can even sharpen it with a cosmetic um, sharpener. And you want to save your shavings because the little shavings can be um, diluted and dissolved in water to create beautiful paint. So that's a nice, you know, these kinds of sticks, there's also water soluble or watercolor crayons that are more like a lipstick consistency, but they can be, um, they can be spread and blended with water. There's also water-based inks. Um, you've heard of alcohol ink. You may have heard of India ink. These are actually water-based inks. And what's nice about them is that instead of mixing your own watercolor with, with the, the dry pigment or even the, even the um, paint pigment, this is totally fluid like water and it's really vibrant. Oh my gosh, these colors are so vibrant. And then you can, um, it, you can just dip your brush right in them. Um, there's also such a thing as watercolor pencils, and these are uh, water soluble so that as you draw, you can treat them like a regular colored pencils, um, but you can actually brush over them with a wet brush and really bloom, really pop out that color and fill in spaces that you've outlined with color. So um, lots of different ways that watercolor as a medium is is produced for you to, to for you to play with. You can even get um, dot cards, and you can buy little sets of these little cards. And this is just a little splooge of, of pigment, just like what comes out of in the pan, or just like what might come out of the tube. And it's dry. And the beauty of watercolor um, is that you can reactivate it with water. So even when it dries, you can still use it. And so when you have, you know, a little mess in your palette, you can just add a little water to the screen and I can reactivate some paint right there. So you never have to clean up after yourself, which I like. <laughs> Whereas with acrylic paints and oil paints, you know, you, they, you have to kind of clean up and, and do things. Um, and so these dot cards are really fun because this allows you to try fancy paint before you buy, right? It's much less expensive to buy a few dot cards and experiment with the colors. Um, so those are the different styles of paints. Any questions at this point? I'm going to move on to brushes. There is one question. Yes. Um, will you be somebody uh, anonymous would like to know, will you be showing us how to stretch our paper and what tape works best? And they're thanking you for offering the class. Um, yeah, I, you know, definitely talking about uh, when we get to the demo part where I'm where we're actually painting together, I will talk about ways to to mask off your area. Um, and I, 
Um, I have been seeing a, a, a surge of people using uh, decorative washi tape instead of painter's tape. I mean, I've always just used the blue painter's tape if I wanted to, to mask off some border lines, but I'm seeing people use washi tape because it's less tacky um, and it, it's less likely to tear the paper underneath. Okay. And, um, and you can get decorative washi tape at any craft store um, and uh, certainly at, at some art stores too. Um, um, anything and, else? Yes, there. Um, somebody's mentioning, Sarbani mentions that there's watercolor pens and how good do you think those are? Um, I haven't tried uh, the watercolor, I haven't tried a water, watercolor pen um, personally, I've only worked with the what I the, uh, the materials that I just showed you the pencils, the pigment sticks, the crayons. Um, I can't even think of what the brand might be of a of an actual marker that is water based, but I know they're out there. Oh, of course I can. Marabou makes one. Yes, duh. Thank you. I had a little a little brain um, a little a little pause there. Um, there is an aqua pen that Marabou makes that I like very much. Uh, I don't have one handy. I think it's buried. Um, but yes, and I, I do like working with them. Now, it is harder to um, remove your lines. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for one of those pens. I thought I had some here, but I don't. Um, but I do like working with them. They're really great if your style is very bold and colorful, and especially like the young, the younger kids. Um, and if there's any teens or uh, people watching right now, you millennials, <laughs> um, the manga, the anime, the, 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 the styles of illustrating and sketching that are, you know, the video game styles of characters are great for the watercolor pens because you do keep that hard edge, but you can kind of smudge that color in. Um, with with a brush of of water just like with the pencils so i don't personally work with that style but yes i have played with them okay and um is there a paint option you recommend for beginners Teresa? i would start with a very simple set of pans like this and i would recommend you tr you look for something just a a notch above the the least expensive things that you see for kids where it's 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 kind of a rectangle plastic with little ovals of paint right sometimes those pigments are not really fully loaded and it's a lot more filler than pigment so you don't get as beautiful um uh, as bold and beautiful of your colors and they're not as necessarily as nice for blending but if you get a set that has these little pans and and the colors look really nice and rich I, um, this one is, this brand is uh, hard to pronounce. It's Shipper or Farben. Um, and I just picked this up online on Amazon because it, because I was looking specifically for a travel case. And these paints have been great. Daniel Smith, full disclosure, I work for them, uh, makes really fabulous. I mean, if you can, if you can afford Daniel Smith, get yourself over to a, a an art supply store in Oakland because Contra Costa County doesn't have any. Um, and get yourself a, a nicer a nicer pan like this. But any any uh, any hard um, watercolor like that is is probably the easiest thing to start with. Okay, that's great. And somebody okay. said mentioning they're using cardstock instead of watercolor paper. But... And we'll get to. I'm going to talk about paper in two shakes, yeah. and we'll talk okay, about that. Great. And um, I forgot to mention that Lisa that people yeah. should stay to the end because. There is a chance for a prize at the end of the program. I forgot to mention that. That's right. The Stick around. That's right. Um, so brushes, you know, just like uh, dad always said, there's, a, you know, you know, and mom, sometimes you got to use, it's best to use the right tool for the job. So there are lots of different kinds of brushes. And I only recently learned that the um, round brush that is shaped like this is actually ideal for watercolor for a few reasons. Because of the fuller base, as opposed to a flat brush, for example, this, this holds all of the water, all of the watercolor. It When you dip your brush in, in, in the well that you've blended, it holds all kinds of paint up here at the top. And then this pointed tip allows you to control it for a long period of time as you're painting. So the round brush is desirable in that way. Um, a large flat brush is desirable if you're painting a large wash 
a, a, like a like a sky. You're just painting a big area with a large wash of color. A flat brush can be helpful for that. Otherwise, when you're doing smaller work or more detailed work, then there's a variety of size brushes that you might wanna play with. And again, the shape of the brush can do the work for you. A, a brush like this, that has this sort of um, shape where it's actually a little narrower at the bottom and a little more bulbous at the top is great for petals and leaves because literally the act, and, and I'll show you when in just a moment, the act of just pressing and lifting, it's kind of like a calligraphy pen. It creates the shape for you. And if you're, if any of you are familiar with some of the decorative painting techniques using craft paints, they, you know, those one stroke techniques, a lot of that can be accomplished in watercolor as well. There's, there's brushes that have, that have, uh, you know, special shapes for special textures. Um, and I actually like a flat brush for lines and filling in large areas. And then of course you, you can find these really, really tiny uh, uh, brushes for, for, for lines and detailed work. They even have ones that have like three hairs. I mean, one hair They're like, you can get them really, really tiny for doing really detailed lines. Um, but you know, we're not going there right now in a beginner class. Um, so experimenting with different shaped brushes and different size brushes is a lot of fun and it will, and you'll really get a sense for how the, the brush stroke changes the shape, how it delivers the, the, the paint to the paper, and um, you'll get a feel for what you like best. And it's really, it's a, really a personal preference, even though some, some people, like I really like using a flat brush for straight lines, whereas other people prefer a, the point of a round brush to do straight lines. It's up to you. Any questions about brushes before I move on to paper? There is one question. Um, what three quarter brushes should a beginner get? What, what three, three quarter? Uh, yeah, three quarter brushes. Like they're three, saying three slash four, yes. like three quarters. Or you oh, know, yeah. I don't. I mean, I don't, three or oh, I see. I'm sorry. They mean what three or four brushes should I get? Oh. <laughs> That's what they. Yes. Yeah, so if you were just going to get a few. I would definitely get one that's sort of a larger flat for washes. I would definitely get a good size uh, round brush like this with the pointed tip. And then I would get maybe a really small flat brush and a small uh, round tip. Um, so you've got, yeah, that's, I think that's where I would start. So, you know, these, you've got two sizes of flat here and around. I will also recommend a barrel brush if you're interested in plein air painting and watercolor is very popular for plein air painting. Um, these brushes have a, a plastic barrel and you just screw it off and you fill them with water. And that way you don't have to carry water with you in a separate container. You just take the lid off and you've got a nice um, brush tip. Some of them are flat, some of them are pointed. Um, and so um, a barrel brush is really handy for traveling or journaling, uh, going on vacation and, you know, sitting on the beach with a, a little journal and a, and a barrel brush and, and a little, you know, travel size uh, pan of paints. It's awesome. So that's another option are these barrel brushes. Um, paper. All right, the main thing about watercolor paper is that you wanna use watercolor paper for watercolor. There's mixed media paper, there's plain paper, there's cardstock as was mentioned before. And you, you, the reason watercolor paper is important is because it's designed to, to, to soak up the water and not warp, to handle all of that moisture. And, um, and so a lot of watercolor paper is really thick like this one, this is um, 140 pound, this little number will tell you the weight of it. And 140 pound is very, it's very thick. It's thick like a postcard thick. Um, a number lower than that, like 90 pound, it will be a little thinner. Um, but so you, so working with heavy watercolor paper is, is, is important for being able to, you know, really load it up with moisture. But um, you can use thinner paper. Like this is a journal that has, um, much thinner paper in it. It's thicker than copy paper, but it's um, but it still holds up to watercolor. And there are small journals like this. And I like getting, I recommend starting with a journal because you can really, it's easy to practice and flip around and go back and, 
And then usually the pages are perforated so that you can tear it out if you've got a masterpiece that you're ready to frame. But what's nice about a little flip book like this is again, portability. And I really encourage you to consider um, taking your watercolors with you on the road, whether you go to visit a park or go for a walk or go on vacation, um, because you can really get a lot of inspiration from the outdoors. Um, and what's nice about these flip books also is that they provide a, a sturdy work surface if you're not sitting at a table. The other um, way papers will come is on a block like this. And this block is, um, sometimes the blocks are sealed on all four sides and you have to get a little, a little um, slicer to, to take the page off. But this, uh, regarding the question earlier about what kind of tape to use, which people will tape down their paper to not only give them a crisp border when they're done, but to also pre help prevent the paper from buckling and curling when it gets too wet. But when you work with a, a block of watercolor paper, um, you, you don't have to worry about that because it stays, it's, it's bound, it's, it's glued like a, like a pad of paper is, right? This one is only glued on one side, but some of them are glued on three or four sides. I'm gonna, um, this is the paper I'm gonna work on. So I'm gonna pull this out. The other thing to know about watercolor paper is the difference between cold press and hot press. And let me just set that aside. Um, cold press and hot press refers to the texture of the surface and you'll see it on the package. It will say one or the other. And um, hot, press is smooth and cold press is more nubby and textured and it's hard to see the texture on the camera but the way i remember that hot press is smooth is like an iron it's 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 like the texture of the paper has been ironed flat ironed smooth with hot iron so hot press is smooth cold press is more like just soaking up the water with a sponge and create and you're left with a a slightly nubby piece of paper. So that's how I remember it. I personally love cold press. I love the texture. I love what it adds to the painting. But if you're doing something that's a lot of detail, then you're going to want to work with cold press, which is smoother. And the pricing is all over the board on watercolor paper. And, it, and it's very, what I said before about paints, absolutely start out with an inexpensive pad and, you know, a medium size and then work your way up to, you know, something a, a little higher quality, a little thicker and see how you like it. Um, you can buy little uh, small pads like these six by six tiles are great um, to start out with. It's, it's inexpensive to get a, um, a pad of these little six by six sheets and it allows you to sort of work on a smaller scale and, and build your skills. Any questions about paper before I move on to actually like painting? <laughs> mm -hmm. um yeah there we have a few more about brushes so you can tell me if you sure, go ahead okay um can they want to know if they can cut off the stray brush hairs or should they get a new brush um it depends i mean um ideally if you're taking care of your brushes and they're decent quality you shouldn't get any stray brush hairs but yeah it, uh, you could you can cut it off and and it, not damage it too much if it's a big enough brush like if it's a really small brush um, you may want to just toss it if, if things got a little too wonky. I will say when you are um, cleaning your brushes and with watercolor, it's so easy because everything's water based. And so it's super, I mean, just dipping it in your water jar and swirling it around and dabbing it on a paper towel, boom, it's clean. But you always want to dry your brushes with the brushes pointing down. A lot of people tend to want to stick them like in a pencil cup pointing up. You don't want to do that because water gets into this little metal. Oh, I forget what the neck of these things are called. There's a special name um, for the neck of this and I, I'm blanking on it, but water gets down in there and that can um, ruin, ruin your, your brush and, and actually, you know, loosen it up and you don't want that. So always, always dry your brushes down in, this way and all, all that I, or even at an angle, like I just have like a little a little sponge next to my sink and after I've blotted and I just dry them, you know, just sitting, you know, so they're just at a little bit of an angle like that. Okay. 
Um, he, the, we are getting some requests to wait till the end, so I'm trying not to give you all the okay. questions at once. And let's let's. <laughs> so what do we got. Yeah, um, we've got. I'll give you just about, one that's about paper, and then we'll move on, and then we'll get to the other one. Is sure. there a right or wrong side of the paper? Um, not usually. Um, usually for both cold and hot press, the the both sides are the same. I haven't seen any, I haven't seen any brands where they're remarkably different. Um, I, I'm not a purist though. So, and I'm also not a master artist. So I'm sure that there are, there are highly seasoned watercolor artists that might tell you otherwise, but, but um, I think they're, they both feel pretty much the same. Mostly I use, I mean, in a, in a journal, you're flipping the pages front to back anyway. And that's the other beauty of having something thick is that you can work on the other side, especially if you're practicing. It's nice to have some that you can flip over and, and keep playing. Um, as far as palettes, uh, obviously with, with your watercolor set, you're gonna have a palette built in most likely. Um, and a palette is just simply, we call this a well, this little dented area that can hold a little water and then a larger area to, to blend more color. If you're doing large areas, you can get a little palette like this that has deeper wells. And you can even use um, freezer paper, which is glossy smooth on one side, or you can buy palette paper, which is basically freezer paper, but fancier. But what's great is that you save it because you can reactivate these colors until they're gone. So having a little mister bottle handy is great because you can literally take what you were working on a week ago, a month ago, a long time ago, and reactivate it with a little mister bottle. And boom, I've got paint that's left over from this smudge from forever ago. So, um, you know, definitely uh, I like this idea of freezer paper, as long as I'm working with small amounts, because obviously you don't want the water to travel all over the place, right? Um, and look what I'm talking about. This is a round brush and look how just the shape of it gives me something like a petal. And, and, um, and then if I, just the shape of it, and if I switch to a, a, a green, I can, I can even, you know, bring, uh, bring it down to a point for a stem. So this, this is the round brush that I was talking about as definitely being uh, a, a go-to. Um, so palettes, that's that. Now, when, when you see watercolor painting, you, you almost always see a sketch first. You see a pencil sketch almost all the time. You see people will, will draw from a picture as a reference or they'll be outside and they'll draw a vista in their view and they'll sketch it out and color it in. And so a lot of watercoloring, uh, traditional watercolor is, is coloring. It's you've created a drawing and now you're filling it in um, and you're, you know, you're covering your pencil lines. And sometimes if you look really closely at some watercolors, you still see the pencil lines. And that is an argument, um, in my opinion, for um, doing a sketch with a watercolor pencil in the colors that make sense. Because then if, if you do need to, if a line does need to stay put, it'll be in the color you want it. Just something to think about. Um, but I also recommend for beginners a cheater method. And that is, baking parchment and you can trace. The masters used to project images onto the wall and, and then trace them onto canvas. So you can take an image, you can take a photograph or an image that you, you know, print out and you can trace it onto baking parchment. This is the, the natural kind. It, it also comes in white. Same stuff you use to bake cookies. And baking parchment is a non-stick. And so when you take a pencil, whether it's a colored pencil or a regular pencil, and you trace your lines, I'm just gonna just trace his little head and his little eyeball here. And maybe I'll even trace just the top part. Okay, so you trace these little, you trace this image that you want to paint, you flip it over and rub it down, just like rub-ons that we've had, crafters are used to know about rub-ons. And, um, you know, kids know about rub on tattoos. Um, and so you can, it actually, because this baking parchment is nonstick, it will release the pencil marks. And now you've, your tracing has gone right down onto your page and you can continue painting. 
So I highly encourage you to cheat and trace. <laughs> um, and whether you're, you know, whether you're uh, tracing uh, something, a little colored image like this that I printed off, or like little, you can you can find little outlines of shapes that you like. Um, you know, this is an out. This is an illustration of a fish. Now, keep in mind, I'm I'm not worried about copyright protection because I'm not selling any of this work. But if you are planning to sell your work, you don't want to use somebody else's drawings, right? You wanna you wanna do your own drawings or trace your own photograph. Now, <laughs> notice that I've that this is a picture of me. I printed it in black and white. If you wanted to do a portrait, and I highlighted just the key lines with a darker pen. And I can, um, so that I can more easily trace over that and create, uh, in my opinion, a more abstract version of a portrait. So tracing paper, uh, baking parchment is great for tracing. Um, just remember that whatever you trace, when you flip it over to release the pencil onto your paper, it will be in reverse. So you wanna make sure if it's a directional piece, you wanna trace the right side. <laughs> you can even, um, you can even uh, trace, you know, like this is a, po a Van Gogh postcard from the exhibit. I hope you all were able to attend in San Francisco. So, you know, tracing, don't, if you, if you feel like, oh my God, I don't have drawing skills, don't worry. You can trace and still have as much fun as everybody else. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about color blending. Oh, and, and we, uh, we talked a little bit about shapes of brushes there, but, same same idea if i if i dip if i dip um this little uh fan brush into the paint i'm gonna get little dots right i'm gonna get this texture by tapping it to the page and that's a whole a whole other cool kind of effect it could be part of a bloom it could be part of a of a tree branch could be reeds along the water course I tend to go for nature elements but this is my point about experimenting with different shape brushes to see what kind of strokes you get and, and it and it literally does the work for you and it can help you create something that you didn't even think you were going to create and and you're off to the races and that's always fun happy accidents are great um, I do want to say one thing about the color wheel before we start blending some colors because watercolor is all about blending. Um, and certainly you can buy every color under the sun. I mean, this brand, Daniel Smith, for example, has 261 different colors. Every blend known to the universe is available as an individual color, so you don't have to do a lot of blending. But you can, you know, you can start with just a small palette like this, and you can even start with five colors because if you're familiar with the color wheel, this is basically the three primary colors that make up every other color in the world, along with black and white, but blue, yellow, and red are our three primary colors, right? So a color wheel kind of helps you remember and you can get fancier color wheels that show more gradations in between, but it, it helps you pick colors because colors that are next to each other anywhere on the color wheel will blend nicely, right? Yellow and green blend nicely. Yellow and orange blend nicely. Red and orange blend nicely, right? Colors that are opposite each other provide really nice contrast. So just like Christmas, green and red look good together, right? Yellow and purple look good together. Blue and orange look good together. And not because they blend, because they don't, you'll get brown or mud, but because they offer really nice contrast against each other. And when you think about the colors in nature, you know, that's, that's really what you're looking at. These cooler tones compared to these warmer tones. So this helps you pick colors when you're just starting out and you want to decide, you know, well, what should I, what color should I use for my flower? Um, and so the color wheel is a helpful tool. Um, I highly, uh, this is, I just printed out, but you can absolutely get a nicer one that, that um, has more, more science on it <laughs> from the art store. So let's, uh, let's, let me get a brush that I want. And it just, wouldn't you know it? There we go. I'm going to get the right brush. You want to have a little, um, a little uh, old washcloth or uh, just a little uh, folded up paper towel next to you. Um, you want you have your 
palette and your paints and your paper and get yourself comfortable. You've got a little vessel of water and, and some, I keep a, a separate container of clean water so that I can, you know, if this one gets a little too cloudy, uh, I can switch. It's not hard to use the same brush between colors um, if you use your paper towel to kind of gauge how much red is left on here, for example. I'm not gonna worry too much about that tonight just for the sake of um, racing through. So um, blending is all about a lot of water. Now you can start, if you know you're gonna blend, let's say I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna work with um, the yellow and the orange and the red. So I'm actually even gonna move my pans. That's the other nice thing about the kind of sets that have movable pans, because if you can actually move the colors together that you're gonna work with and, and get the other ones out of your way. And that, that allows you to kind of cross contaminate and blend more. And you never have to worry too much about getting green on top of your yellow and because you can just wipe it off. And um, having some baby wipes handy is good for that. So you can take a mister, a couple different things you can do. You can take a mister and get your paint wet to kind of start off the show. Um, you can uh, just use your wet brush to, um, to start mixing and getting your paint wet. And you just, you, you just grab, you just rub and grab it over here, add a little more water. If you want the color to be lighter, add a little more pigment to get it a little darker. And so when you have just a little puddle started, you can start painting. Now, I recently learned from a master artist um, named Lauren McCracken that painting with warm water instead of cold water is best because the, what did he say? The second law of thermodynamics <laughs> that solids dilute into liquid form faster with warm water. Um, and I hadn't ever thought of that before, but um, I, you know, just, just a little tip that I learned. So here I've got some orange and again, I'm just, I'm just going to loosely, uh, we're going to do a feather in just a minute, but I'm just going to loosely show you how much color I mixed there. Okay. And I can draw it down and get fainter or uh, when it dries, I can add more. So I'm really just, just kind of streaking it down for you. So you can see that I have got it I can add more pigment directly in there and really get it nice and dark. Um, or I can add more water and spread that color down and get a nice gradation. Now, you probably you may have heard. Let me pause for a minute. Any questions? You're going to wait till the end. Is that what we decided? Uh, yeah, I think we could wait for these ones. But somebody okay. did want to point out that the word you were looking for was fural. The name of this little guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It's like sailing. They have all these unique language that I, it's like, why can't you just say left instead of port? <laughs> so excellent. Thank you. Um, so uh, where was I? Um, there's, there's a technique of painting wet on wet or wet on dry. Wet meaning the paint on wet meaning the paper or wet on dry, meaning the paper. So you'll notice I just painted on dry paper just then. I grabbed my wet paint on dry paper and the colors didn't bloom or bleed out too much. Same with, same with these little areas over here. My point stayed pointy, my little spot stayed spotty and the color soaked right into the paper and stayed put. If you wet the paper first with a little mister or a brush, a wet, a, a wet brush of clean water, and now you're gonna take some paint and I'm just gonna mix a little red into my orange. And now you're going to paint on this wet area. Now you've got some bleeding and some blooming happening and it starts to feather out a little bit. And I'm gonna show you how that can be even more fun in an actual um, shape. But you can, if you want a fuzzy edge, like I could literally, by just tapping this fuzzy edge and letting it bleed out, I've got a carnation, right? And I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna take, I can, from there I can take and, and create my stem and boom, I've got a carnation. And I can come back later after that dries, I can, I can tap it with my finger and create a little texture while it's wet. 
and see how that dries and look how that automatically created some more flower like texture. But don't be afraid to use your finger um, and see how much that's feathering out on the edges, which is really cool, whereas this one did not. So that's wet on wet versus wet on dry. So a couple little quick techniques there. Um, while I'm here with this little pencil sketch of this hummingbird head, I'm gonna take my damp brush and I'm gonna run it along that line and show you, I'm doing it very loosely. I'm not really paying attention. I, if I was gonna go slower, I would be more careful. But see how I was able to pull the color from that line into the center and almost, but not quite remove the line and, um, I was able to fill in quite a bit of color, not, at, not as deep as I did here, but this is what I'm talking about with the colored pencils. And you can really push the pigment from that line out um, pretty far and you can get, it, get that line pretty soft. So I just wanted to show you that since it was there. When the paint is dry, that's when you can work over it and, and make it darker. So like this over here is dry. And so if I really wanted to, if that was just too pale, or maybe I wanted to add another layer of, of, of petals in the foreground, I was able to do that without reactivating the, the bottom layer by waiting for it to dry. Um, once it's soaked into the paper, it's pretty tough to reactivate as opposed to when it's on a smooth piece of palette paper or freezer paper. So um, you can definitely work in layers um, like that. Now, keep in mind, the beauty of watercolor is transparency. And even though these colors feel really dark and opaque, they're actually pretty transparent. And you can, um, you can get some interesting effects by layering paints on top of each other after they've dried. So like if I take some yellow and come over the top, of this orange. Now, now I've changed the tone entirely, but, but it's transparent. You can still see the orange underneath. And so this is really fun. The layering idea it, technique is really, really fun. Now notice I did get a little feathering down here because I was washing it, the color out with water. And so it got kind of wet down there. This is really feathered out. And of course, once, paint dries, it always gets a little lighter, which is why layering can be um, a good alternative to keep your colors vibrant if that's what you want. A lot of watercolor work can be pretty um, pale in my opinion, and it looks beautiful. I really like working with more vibrant colors myself. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you, oh, I was gonna show you uh, with the uh, watercolor sticks, I'm going to draw, I'm going to flip this over and I would encourage you to draw a feather. Okay. Now I have a couple of uh, little feather shapes here for reference. I happen to like this shape and uh, to show you, I just had it open. Hold on to show you what I've done before. This is like, this is a, a feather is a great shape to practice blends and bleeding and blooming because it can, a feather, you can't screw up a feather. It can look like anything, right? It's the, it's just a beautiful organic shape and, and ha being really creative with how the colors merge together is really, really fun. And I encourage you to work with simple shapes when you're starting out so that you feel successful. Um, a, a feather is my go-to shape. Leaves are my go-to shapes. Simple petal flowers like you just saw are my go-to shapes. And um, a pear, a, a a piece of fruit, a pear is one of my favorite, and I don't have one handy. Um, it's one of my favorite things. Here I was practicing with leaves and just practicing with, with, with color blending and bleeding and gradations. So start with simple shapes and really have fun with a simple shape. So I'm gonna encourage you to draw a feather and I will give you a, a little hint. I usually will draw kind of the dots of the top and bottom, allowing a little space for your, um, base, right? So I kind of create that dot. And then I use dots just like coloring in to gradually increase that width so that I can create a little outline for myself because then it's easier to draw 
a freehand line if you have some dots along the way, and dots are easier to position than lines. Um, so that's the way I tend to do it. And what I'll usually do is where I have a dot, I will leave a space for the feather, right? So I'll connect that line, then I'll leave a little space and I'll connect this line and leave a little space, go up a little further and just keep going like that, leaving a couple little spaces along the way. And I want my spaces on the left and right to be in different places because I don't want anything to be symmetrical. And I can kind of make my feather be kind of, you know, like that. And then what I do with those spaces is I will draw those little, those little V's that create those little breaks in the feathers. Okay, so there's the um, easy way to draw a feather. These little V's, and I have them sort of pointing down into the center. And I'm gonna um, I'm gonna leave the center alone, even though the the rib of the feather you know is showing as white here. I'm gonna leave that alone for now because I can kind of create the essence of of a center rib with my color. Um, so anyway, quick like I said, simple shapes. Um, now this is a pure pigment, and it's called it's a blue. It's a uh, in den thrown blue, the pigment names are always hard to pronounce. I'm gonna use a flat brush because I'm gonna bring this color in and I kind of want to have that linear stroke like feathers, right? So I'm actually going to, after I've drawn this, I'm going to gently mist my paper and I'm gonna have my brush be just a little damp. And I'm just gonna see what happens when I run my brush right up to the line and stroke it down, right up to the line and stroke it down. And I'm just bringing in the color, letting it bleed a little bit because I, I misted that paper. And I, I encourage you to start, you can start with a dark color on the outside or you can start with a light color on the outside, completely up to you. But notice I'm stroking in the direction of the feather, right? If, if, if this was a real feather, there would be a, an obvious direction of each of those little, um, I don't know what the individual strands of a feather are called, do you? The person who knew about the, the tip of the brush? <laughs> um, anyway, so playing with brush strokes and working in the direction of the natural object is how you get something to look more realistic. If you're working with a circle, then circular strokes create the illusion of a rounded dimension, right? Um, so definitely your brush strokes going in the order, going in the order, going in the direction makes a difference. Now notice how in some areas I picked up a little more pigment and my brush was a little wetter. In other areas, it's a little paler, but look at that already. Now that right there is gorgeous, in my opinion. I just love the shape so much. And you know, I I um I like working in loose format, and and I think that if you allow yourself to stay loose and don't worry too much about a perfect result, you will you will feel so much better about your skills, and you will be so much happier with your results. Um, so I encourage you to consider that. So now I'm just kind of going in. I'm not worried about having some some fuzziness because feathers are fuzzy. Another reason why I like working with feathers because you just you just can't mess them up. Um, but I am using the benefit of this flat brush to stay on my line, right? Okay, so I've I've brought in some color. I'm kind of going a little darker on the top, and I'm leaving the the bottom a little lighter so that I can create a little gradation. So now, what color should I blend into the blue? I'm uh, thinking a little purple, right? So I don't have, let me see here. If I have some purple, I can reactivate. I do not. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna um, blend a little purple. I could, I could wash out my well here and, and start fresh, but I'm just gonna blend a little purple into my red because I know those two colors blend well together as well. Why? Because my color wheel told me so. So I'm just grabbing, I'm dampening my brush, just dipping it in my water. My water is kind of red right now, so I'm okay with that. And I'm just creating 
a little bit of purple to play with. And I'm my paper is kind of dry, so I'm going to mist it one more time very lightly because I don't want it to buckle too much, but I do want this purple to spread. So I'm going to just dot my purple in a few areas of this wet paper and let it do its thing and see what happens. And I might, I might streak it a little bit, right? Because of the lines of a feather. You could do that with the edge. You can get really nice straight lines with the edge of a straight brush, see that? If I don't like that, I can kind of wash it over. I can tap my brush and get little bits of texture. And I can dampen my brush and just kind of push some of that purple into the blue so that it looks just like a little more natural, you know, mix. And I can even pull a little more of the blue from my outline down into that purple. And that's really beautiful. I always say my, my classroom mantras are always to enjoy the journey and do not fret about the destination. Just enjoy playing and experimenting. Now look how nicely my blue and purple have blended on the edge there, but I've still kept a hard edge. And that's going to happen with those sticks. If you didn't want the hard edge, if you wanted, then you would, um, you would, you might use something uh, lighter, just a light pencil to do your drawing. And you can soften up that edge and you can even extend your feather out beyond it if you want to. All right. So you're just playing on uh, that purple. I'm really kind of digging it. So I'm going to bring it in. And again, trying to kind of create some brush strokes or some tapping in the general direction of the feathers. But you can also do that in a, in a second layer, right? If you just wanted to fill in a solid color, you could create that in a second layer, the, that texture. And while it's still damp, I want a contrasting color now for this area. And what contrasts with purple and blue, according to the color wheel, that would be yellow. And I say contrast because it's opposite on the color wheel. So contrast is a nice highlight color. So I'm just gonna, I, I'm just gonna soup this up right in the pan because I don't have a clean spot. And again, I'm just gonna kind of dab that in the center and then spread it around and see, see, what, I, see what happens. And maybe, uh, maybe I go all the way up to the top and maybe my paper's a little too dry so I don't get as much blending action. So maybe I squirt it just a little bit because I'm warping my paper a tiny bit, but that's why you start with really good thick paper so you can do that. And so the idea is to just play and, and see where the, where, the, where the colors take you. And um, now I'm getting a little bit of a green action, which I kind of like, right? Because yellow and blue, when it comes together, makes green. And so this would be a point at which I would stop and maybe I'm kind of organically dotting some of that color down into the purple. And this would be where I would stop because I don't want to get too much of this brown. That's what happens when contrasting colors come together, right? So this would be where I would stop and let it dry and then come back and layer some more color over the top of it. And, you know, I could play with my edges and do whatever I want. I could even, if I really wanted a hard edge, I could even come back um, after it's dry with a, with a colored pencil or a marker and, and um, you know, really firm up that outline. I could do that if I wanted to. Um, so any questions? We are at the five minute to the end mark. Perfect time for questions. It is perfect timing. Yes, we have a few questions. Um, Go ahead. What, did you use a watercolor pencil when you were doing the tracing? Um, well, the only thing I traced was that little bird head. Yeah. Um, on that I used the baking parchment, and yes, that was a watercolor pencil. Okay. This oh, okay. drawing was a, a watercolor stick. Okay. A little bit different. The stick is more pure pigment, whereas the pencil has a little bit more of a waxy binder in it. Okay. Thank you. Um, is there a right or wrong side on the parchment paper to trace? 
No, no, it's the same on both sides. Okay. Um, and then do you pref do you have a preference over the watercolor markers or the paint? Do you have a preference? Um, I, uh, like I said before, I like working with paint because it's softer and I can go more abstract. You know, it, it, painting with watercolor doesn't have to be representational. It can be very abstract and very, very fuzzy and, and very, you can create, you know, things that have no, no purpose in real life, just beautiful shapes and colors and, and, and blends. So that's why I like the paints in any form. Um, but the, but the markers are great when you really want a solid line. And I do, hold on a second. I did just see when I looked up where my watercolor markers are this is the brand again full disclosure i work for this company but these ones um, I'll, I'll show you this is called the aqua pen and it has two nibs a brush nib on one side and a more of a fine point nib on the other side and so what you get here is a real hard line i'm just going to do like a little rough um kind of a dahlia carnation kind of a shape right with my little lines and then you would take your brush and you could pull some of that color down and fill it in but you're still going to have a really hard line but you get this great sort of effect um, with the softness of of the color in between um, so the, pe the people that do marker art, so here's the artwork on the box using these pens, right? It's, it's a very modern cartoon kind of marker art where you can see that they use the, the nib for the hard lines and then they use the brush nib to sort of fill in and you just, you know, literally are laying just a little touch of color in, um, let me grab another color real quick. You're just adding a little touch of color in an area and then and then uh filling it in you know spreading it around a little bit with a wet brush so i like the markers but they're not my personal go-to but they're fun if if you like that hard line okay great so um people have a question about synthetic brushes are they or are those okay synthetic brushes okay and, or do you prefer another type? Um, I am not a purist. So I go, I go for what I can afford. And most of the time it's synthetic. Yeah. And you mentioned having like a sketch pad or a watercolor pad. Do you paint with it in the pad or do you tear it off? Depends. Um, if it's, um, if it's thick enough, um, and it's sturdy, I will paint right in, right in there and notice how I've got, you know, two completely different things. Oh, it's upside down, but I was experimenting on this side and then I was experimenting on this side and there's no bleed through. So um, I paint right in the book in some time in this case, because it was a journal that I was, you know, taking with me. Oh, this is fun. Um, this is a, a coarse uh, kosher salt on top of wet watercolor. And when it dries, it creates this galaxy effect. Really cool. Sprinkle salt on wet watercolor and see what happens. Magic. Um, so, but, and then, but I, if you do paint with a single sheet, you can see how it warped just a tiny bit from the moisture, even though it was really thick, high quality paper. So that's when you might tape it down onto like a little piece of poster board, you know, a little work board. And, and by taping it down, you can do your washes to create a background. Like if you were doing a scenic kind of vista or a landscape, um, and when you peel the tape off, you'll have this nice smooth line and you kind of create a little natural frame for yourself. Um, so that's a, an advantage to working on a sheet instead of a book or a pad. So it's up to you. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, we had more than one question about, you mentioned art stores, specifically you said something about Oakland. So people would love to know your advice on yeah. an art supply store. In uh, Contra Costa County, all we have are craft chains. And there are only two craft chains whose names will pass my lips and that's Joann's and Michael's. The third one will not be named in my opinion. However, craft 
chains do have a fine art aisle. It, it's not um, a lot of variety and it's not a lot of different things. Um, notice oh, I got this really squishy when I, I <laughs> it was still wet. So happy accidents, turn that into something else, make it into a background. Don't fret when you get these little accidents. Mistakes are always design opportunities in my book. Um, so yes, you can get some, some fine art supplies, paints, markers, pigment sticks at the craft chains. But if you want to go to Disneyland and you want to get a lot of different art supplies and you want to really see the variety and see things like masking fluid, what is this? This is what you put on top of an area of your watercolor paper to paint over and leave that space white. Then you rub it off and it, it's like a little, it, it masks out a certain area where you want to keep it white, uh, but you want to do a nice smooth wash first. You don't find that at a craft store. Watercolor ground is a medium where you can put this as a foundation on any surface like wood or plastic or metal or ceramic and give it the texture of paper. And then you can use watercolor on that surface because you don't usually watercolor on anything except paper. So little, you know, so all these other little things that are so fabulous for watercolor can be found in an art supply store. The closest ones are in Oakland and that would be Blick. Um, formerly known as Dick Blick, but it's Blick Art Materials, uh, and also Flax, F-L-A-X. Flax used to be in San Francisco, and they've got a smaller location in Oakland now, and those stores are wonderful. Blick is a big chain. Flax is a smaller independent, so you can support either one. They both also have online stuff. And then in Berkeley, you've got another Blick, and you've got Artists and Craftsmen. Um, and both are, uh, Artists and Craftsmen is a small chain and Flick is a bigger chain. Um, all three of those stores, fabulous, definitely worth a field trip within driving distance. Um, and of course, otherwise you can go into the city, but I, I don't know of any art supply stores, full on art supply stores in Contra Costa County. We've lost all of them. Used to be a really good one in Danville, gone. So, um, yeah, that's that. And then online, I tell you, there are a, a number of independent small businesses that are online only that carry all kinds of crazy things and fun things for art and craft and mixed media and everything in between. So I will Google what I want and, and find it and get a good price. And um, then I find all kinds of other things from the comfort of my chair. So COVID has taught me to appreciate online ordering <laughs> so much more. But um, Disneyland is pretty special. I tell you, you go to go to Oakland and you'll be you'll have fun. Okay, Look what you. has happened as this was drying. See how um, see how the yellow has sort of bloomed into the purple and it gave it this really soft blend um, and it looks really awesome. Yes. OK. Um, so somebody was asking, how do they reduce the the buckling and I, I think you may have answered it a bit with the taping you down. Yeah, right? two ways. You either work on a pad and it's, it's kind of expensive to buy one, but it lasts a long time. You work on a pad so that it's sealed all the way around and that, that keeps your paper flat and then you slice it off when you're done. Or with a single sheet, you have something underneath like a piece of poster board um, and you use a, a you can use decorative washi tape or blue painter's tape to tape it down before you start. So it's nice and flat and that helps it stay. It will still buckle a little bit, but that helps it stay flat. Um, and again, I'm not a purist, but I have been known to put a pressing cloth and put my iron on low and flatten out my, my artwork when it's done. Uh, again, there will be watercolor artists who would <gasps> gasp at the thought, <laughs> but I do it. I like that. Um, so people want to, they want to see you and know more and learn more from you. So we have a number of questions. First is that somebody wants to know about that other class that you're teaching that I kind of hinted at at the beginning. So I'll sure. go ahead and tell people about that. Um, Lisa will be teaching a class called From Broken to Boho, 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 Boho. Boho. Upcycle, like Boho. Boho. Upcycle Jewelry Making. That's on July 24th at 11 a.m. It's a weekend, so it's not an evening class this time. And there are still spots available. So please visit our website, cccilib.org to sign up for that if you are interested in that kind of crafting. 
Um, they would also just love for you to come back and do like step two. So we'll have to think about that sometime. Okay. Uh, the jewelry class is suggested for adults and teens. So somebody asked that. Um, I think it's just a little more complicated than for kids. Um, and then do you recommend any online classes for, you know, outside of the library for learning more, for learning watercolor? Oh my gosh, there are so many. Um, first of all, if I may recommend somebody local, if you've never been to the Art Cottage, which is, I know some of you are spread out throughout the county, but in Concord, there is a, a gallery called the Art Cottage and it's run by a lady named Fro. And um, it was just named uh, as the best in the county by Diablo Magazine, Woohoo! best art. Um, look what I'm doing here, by the way, I am using a twisted up wet wipe. You could also use a Q-tip to um, remove color and create a little stripey effect. That's kind of fun. Um, Anyway, she does custom classes for a very affordable rate, and she will set you up with uh, studio time and teaching time for whatever mediums you want to learn. Um, I highly recommend checking out the Art Cottage. It's on Mount Diablo Street, downtown Concord. Um, but online, you know, there's, there are a dime a dozen, quite honestly. I mean, you can get so much free instruction on YouTube. In fact, if you go to the Concord Art Association YouTube channel, you can connect to it from ConcordArtAssociation.com. We have uh, a number of videos there that are, uh, some of them are a little bit are older, but there's, um, I think Samantha uh, McNally, there's a video there that's an hour long of her demonstrating her watercolor landscapes and sh with sheep in the field. Fabulous teacher. And that right there is a class that's amazing. And it's, a, it's right there for free on the YouTube channel for Concord Art Association. So yeah, look around, um, look around YouTube, look around, uh, uh, even Facebook groups, um, you can, there's a group that, that um, I'm part of called the Concord Community of Artists on Facebook and anyone can join and we are always sharing information about online classes and events and all kinds of stuff. So check out that Facebook group. We will let you in. Um, and I am right now teaching for the city of Concord Parks and Rec. I'm teaching an eight week mixed media class and we're week, this is week two. So I um, I don't know. You'll have to ask Parks and Rec whether they'll let you come in um, late because I do have some room. You would just miss the first class or two, but that's Thursday mornings at the Senior Center. Um, and I won't be teaching again for a little while, but I highly encourage you to join the Art Association. If not Concord, there's one for Clayton in Creekside. There's one in there's one in Martinez that's really good. There's one out in Brentwood that's really good. Join your local art association. It's very inexpensive and you get a lot of benefits, including guest artist demos every month and the opportunity for, for different kinds of classes and, and connections with artists who are teaching and, and you'll find out what they're doing. Okay, so I, well, we do have to end pretty soon, but... Um, can you say the name of the person that did the landscape with sheep again? Somebody missed that. Oh, uh, Samantha McNally, I believe. There's not that many videos on the Concord Art Association YouTube channel, so you'll have fun going through all of them. Yeah. And then some of the, somebody's saying that some of their art pencils say H, B, and B. Do you know what that means? Uh, I don't. It, it could be a reference to a brand or it could be a reference to a series. I, I, I'd need to see it to know for sure. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate that. So I, I did mention that if you stayed until the very end, which you have all done, um, that there was a chance to win a prize. I'm going to put my email right now into the chat. I'm also the person that sent you your Zoom link so you can reply to me. We have 50 watercolor sets, which includes some, a, a, a set of paints, two watercolor panels, and a very nice paint brush. As I said to the first 50 people who email me at the address that I've just put into the chat or sent to you with your, you know, you, I sent you your Zoom, so you have my email. The first 50 people, I will send it to your library of choice. So in your email, please put your name, phone number, I'm typing this in the chat so you remember, and library. And then we will send the, the kit to your library, the one that you visit the most often, and then you can pick it up there. So as I said, first 50 people. So get emailing and you'll hear from me tomorrow if you were one of those 50 people. So That's thank you awesome. so much, Lisa. And we will see you very soon again. Find me on Facebook, send me a friend request. Yeah.
<laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody.